Thank you, Madam Chief Justice, and may it please the Court. No individual other than a member in good standing of the bar of this Commonwealth shall practice law. So begins Section 46A of Chapter 221 of the General Laws, a statute under which the permission of the Judicial Department this Court has held is not merely important but essential to the privilege of practicing law in this commonwealth. What if, a, um, uh, what if there is a civil action that, um, in, that uh, does not uh, involve Massachusetts parties uh, and a witness, uh, but it, it, there is a witness in Massachusetts and a deposition is taking place uh, in Massachusetts? Do you have to get a Massachusetts lawyer to conduct that deposition? It would depend, Your Honor. In my own practice, there are two contexts in which that situation applies. There would be the federal situation where the federal rules would be supreme over the state unauthorized practice of law rules. In the state context, I've generally gone to, say, New York, for example. I've gone to a court in New York for authorization to take the deposition of the witness in New York. And that, I would assume, would be sufficient to allow me to do so individually. And that procedure would happen as well here in Massachusetts, where a court can come here, uh, a party can come here and obtain from the superior court a subpoena and then leave to take the deposition. Well, what about the situation where you have an out-of-state lawyer who advises uh, someone on a bankruptcy case? who's in Massachusetts, is that unauthorized practice of law? Is he advising him, or is he just filling he out forms? He has them filling out forms and all. Uh, the court's already spoken. Well, I know what we've said, but I want, I want to know, uh, to be consistent, don't you have to say that's unauthorized practice of law, too? Only if it's activity that comes within what this court has traditionally found to be the practice of law. Going back to the 1934 opinion of your predecessors to the Senate, concerning this very statute, uh, Section 46A, going back to the shoe manufacturer's cases. Uh, Mr. Myrick, in the previous argument, really summed up those principles uh, quite succinctly. Uh, the practice of law involves the analysis of facts, the analysis of legal precedent, the presentation of factual arguments to triers of fact. What, the what, what is the harm here? I mean, this person is a lawyer, is he not? He is, Your Honor. So does something magical occur in doing all the things you're talking about when he moves across the state line? He, he violates our law, Your Honor. Uh, this, the legislature has spoken, and this court has said that in enacting Section 46A, the legislature was in its competency to do so. Chris, the curious thing here is this case really has nothing to do with Massachusetts other than geographic convenience. That's not true, Your Honor, uh, in two different respects. First of all, uh, the case was assigned to Boston for a hearing location because the, my clients, Linda Mark and Stephen Mrs. reside in Topsfield and pursuant to the National Association of Securities Dealers standing operating mm -hmm. procedures, customer cases are assigned to the home states of the customers. Where, where would the arbitration award be vacated or confirmed? Uh, there's a proceeding pending right now in the U.S. District Court across the channel before Judge Toro. But not in state court? It's pending in federal court, Your Honor. Okay. And I think contrary to what you might have implied earlier, the lawyers practicing in the United States federal court are bound by Uni Massachusetts um, rules of professional conduct. They are, Your Honor. And I know that our federal court has a local rule which really piggybacks Correct. this court's regulation of lawyers. I know that in other states in the 90s there was a lot of controversy uh, involving the extent to which state regulation over federal employees, for example, uh, could reign supreme. Uh, I was working in the federal government at the time, and it was a matter of great concern for me when I'd go from state to state to state prosecuting a case. Can I ask you, before a, a hearing location is chosen, and there may be, after all, circumstances where 
uh, I gather it's the home state of the customer at the time of the transaction. So things can happen, such as the, you know, the customer moves or you've got customers in different states or whatnot, where it's not you know, abundantly clear where the hearing will be held. Up until the time the hearing site is actually selected and chosen, um, people, I gather, are making their filings in New York with the NASD. Do they have to be members of the New York Bar because they're making filings with the NASD in New York? I'm actually making my filing by sending it by mail from Lynn, Massachusetts to New York. And if you adopt the premise that service or filing by mail is complete upon mailing, I'm engaging in that act here in Massachusetts. What would have happened if they, if say, you know, some one of the customers, the, the missus had split up and one of them was living, you know, somewhere else and all of a sudden the NASD goes, nope, we're going to hold this in Tennessee. If that was for the convenience of the parties, that's within the prerogative of the arbitrators and the NASD. The rules provide for that. And then what do you do then when you appear you in Tennessee? You move for Hakviche? It would depend on what the Tennessee rules provided. I don't know if it were requiring that I appear pro hoc vice, I'd seek leave to do so. If I'd have to advise my clients to get local counsel in Tennessee, I'd do that. I've, you know, and I'm sure everybody has advised counsel with disputes in other states to get. Uh, well, I take it these lawyers did ask, they asked the arbitrator to, uh, arbitration panel to uh, admit them pro hoc vice, and the arbitration panel said that wasn't necessary. That was in what? response to my motion to either stay the arbitration pending this court's action in Chimco and Super Radio or to disqualify them altogether. Right. And they offered, well, we'll move to Proacvici, and the arbitrator said, you don't have to do that. Yeah, he said so that. What could they have done? I mean, they were trying to play by the rules. Three times, Your Honor. And what he could have done and what should have been done, and it actually ties into one of what the appellees have called the secondary declarations, is postpone the arbitration until this court addressed the issue, or perhaps. Mr. Corbett, let me ask you this. As you, let, let's assume that we agree with you <clears throat> that um, uh, this does constitute the practice of law. Right? Sure. So the arbitrators made an incorrect legal ruling. They said this is not the practice of law, <clears throat> um, and which at, at very least is implicit on a particular claim that you made, a perfectly good, straightforward claim. You asked for, in essence, a ruling. Um, they got it wrong. Well, they didn't say that, Your Honor. I know they sure. didn't say that, but isn't that in effect what happened? They said this is not the practice of law for purposes of this arbitration proceeding. That's not what they said. They just said motion to deny, motion denied. And beside the point, Your Honor, this, this Commonwealth has a specific statute, Chapter 251, Section 12, that sets aside as a ground for vacating an arbitral award a failure to postpone the arbitration when a movement advances sufficient cause for doing so. And here we had the pending Shimko case, the pending Super Radio case, and ultimately the declaratory judgment case, the declaratory judgment action that gives rise to this appeal that certainly constituted sufficient cause for waiting to see what this court had to say about the issue before allowing the New York lawyers to go forward in the Boston arbitration. Could I, could I ask you one technical procedural question here? As I understand the chronology of events, um, your motion was denied. Uh, and you uh, came to the single justice, and the single justice here denied you relief, um, but you didn't timely appeal or perfect your appeal to the full bench until after you learned that you had lost the arbitration, by which time it was, it was later than you should have. Why, why shouldn't we just uh, dismiss this appeal as having been untimely uh, perfected? I mean, it seems to me you... Uh, you know, you wanted to wait before you complain. You know, you were waiting to see what the, the arbitrator was going to rule in your favor, and only then did you uh, go ahead with this appeal. Well, there, there's already been motion practice on that issue, Your Honor, and Justice Cowan uh, denied the motion to dismiss the appeal, although she didn't accept the rationale that I sincerely had for waiting to perfect the appeal, which came in the aftermath of the Mass Highway versus Perini case, where it seemed that the issues that had precipitated the declaratory judgment action were moot, 
and therefore my clients didn't have an act of controversy again until after there was an adverse arbitral award. Once that arbitration started, it was possible that they could have prevailed and they wouldn't have had any grievance. They again had a grievance once there was an adverse arbitral award. They moved after the fact, admittedly, for an enlargement of time to docket their appeal. That motion was granted and the, the appeal was proceeded thereafter. Now, they, uh, they could have sent a layperson in here to do this arbitration, could they not? That's not correct under the NASD rules, Your Honor. You have uh, to have a lawyer? Excuse me? You have to have a lawyer? Rule 10316, which is in your appendix at page 236, says that all parties shall have the right to representation by counsel at any stage in the proceedings. Well, shall have the right, but is it required? Does that require a, a lawyer? The answer is no. It uses the word counsel. I'm not aware of whether there is some other provision or some interpretation beyond the scope of the rules that allows for representation by a lay person. I also add, Your Honor, that the NASD's rules are currently being revisited by the association and by the SEC uh, in response to the Burbrower and Rappaport cases, which, uh, according to Professor Gillers, were really a conceptual torpedo in the, concepts of, in the context of the unauthorized practice of law related to arbitration. The NASD has said, uh, while this proceeding was pending, and that's part of the problem I had with what the arbitrators did, they said that our rules don't cover this situation. They said that we need to go to the SEC for authorization to allow out-of-state attorneys to participate in jurisdictions where they are not admitted. And even then, the NASD told the SEC, this is still a matter that's ultimately for the highest court in the respective case states to decide. So even the NASD, the body that sanctioned this particular arbitration, says that this is really a matter for this Commonwealth's law as to whether the participation of these attorneys was authorized or not. With respect to what the court may or may not do with respect to uh, Rule 5.5 of the Rules of Professional Conduct, I know that's a matter that's under consideration, I suggest that the court do what it's done in other cases, like care and protection of Georgette or the Cambridge Trust versus Hanafi and King case, uh, where the court has done the best it could under current law. And here, current law is pretty unambiguous. Section 46A could not be less clear. But address the current problem, the current appeal under current law, and then announce a prospective rule. The if, court if we do that, um, Mr. Corbett, um, if we say that this was the unauthorized practice of law. Um, I'm sure that you looked at the brief in the companion case. Why should we vacate this arbitration award? I mean, even if we, even if we conclude that this was the unauthorized practice of law. The because this was a declaratory judgment action, Your Honor, the specific issue of whether you should vacate the award is not before you. That's pending in federal court, although this court's decision in this appeal will certainly uh, persuade Judge Toro and likely control aspects of that, that proceeding. Uh, with respect to why it should be vacated in an abstract sense, there are really two grounds. First of all is the failure to postpone the arbitration while this court had this specific issue concerning these specific parties under consideration. Uh, in the federal context, that would be called manifest disregard of the law. But you're saying I don't even have to think about that. I just... I don't have to think about that. That's Judge Toro's problem. It's Judge Toro's problem applied to the facts of this case, but there was a secondary declaration requested uh, of the single justice whereby the customers had asked him to declare that the failure to postpone the arbitration pending this court's decision on these issues would constitute uh, grounds for vacating the award. We, we've said, in, in, at least in criminal cases, that a, a defendant who's represented by a lawyer who is under uh, certain technical kinds of suspensions is not entitled uh, to a, a finding of ineffective assistance of counsel just based on that or a new trial. Here, I, I take it that had there been an application for uh, pro hoc vice representation, it would have been allowed. I'm not sure about that, Your Honor, because there's no statutory authorization for it. This court, under the circumstances, might have been able to do that. Uh, could, could, certainly if the court had amended the rules 
as it may do, it could do that. Could counsel have come before the single justice with a petition asking for representation to, with a pro hoc vice petition? I'm not aware of the authority pursuant to which he might have done that. Right now, the court- Assume there was authority. Would, would, would that have been an appropriate place to go? Unless the legislature uh, adopted some provision that allowed the superior court, no, no, for no, example, we can decide, so that no, we can decide who to admit to practice here. I mean, put it this way. Had the lawyer come here and we had said, we don't have any basis, which would be extraordinary because we determine who practices law. I mean, there's a statute as well, but we can decide. There's a, there's a statute that defines the practice of law, but we can decide who to admit here and uh, on a case-by-case -case basis or even more broadly. And if the lawyer had come and we'd said, no, um, we don't think we can let you practice here, then I think um, we would, in essence, be saying we leave it up to the arbitration panel. And so either way. I, I see my time's up, Your Honor, but if I may answer by bringing the court back to sure. what you did in response to Hurricane Katrina in your October 6th order. Uh, you allowed a whole category of attorneys to practice in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, but when you did so, you ensured that they'd be under the supervision of Massachusetts attorneys. You ensured that they'd be subject to the but, disciplinary but that's oversight. What, that's what happens. <clears throat> that follows, as night follows day, um, <clears throat> when you have individual pro hack vice cases, individual pro hack vice cases. I mean, we were sort of uh, bootstrapping it a little to make sure that everybody understood that. Yes, Your Honor, but here the rule or the non-rule that's being advocated by the appellees would create a complete laissez-faire system without any sort of oversight whatsoever. Right. I thank the Court for its attention. Thank you, Mr. Corbett. Mr. Babnick? May it please the Court. This case is different than a lot of other cases. In this case, it was filed in New York in the lawyer's home state for a non-Massachusetts resident that had been injured. The NASD has a policy. It's not found in the rules, the contractual rules that the parties agreed to govern their dispute as to where the location of the hearing would be held. That policy favors customers because customers are typically injured in a customer broker dealer dispute. In this instance, it was the broker dealer, as the arbitrators found, that had been injured to the tune of several hundred thousand dollars. So it wasn't a certainty as to where the hearing would be held. Oh, that's fine. So, the, so then they make a perfectly reasonable decision and they say, hold the arbitration in Massachusetts. Correct. Right. And, and, you, that, and you look up and you see practice of law in Massachusetts. Ah, there's a pending change to the rule. It hasn't been enacted. Massachusetts, ha it's clearly going to be covered. It's clearly covered by the ABA model rule. It, it, if the court adopts the ABA model rule, and I don't know what the, what the, state, what the advisory committee will recommend, but it, it's sufficiently new, different, and other that somebody has said it has to be addressed, partly for the reasons that Mr. Corbett suggests. You don't have just a laissez-faire, that you actually have Massachusetts residents who will know, you know, uh, you know who, who's subjected to which ethical rules. So you didn't ask for it to be in Massachusetts but you were sent to Massachusetts. Correct, Your Honor. You look up the rule, why don't you apply and ask to be admitted pro hoc vice? You're practicing law. Your Honor, we did do that. And our typical practice is, for instance, in California after Burbauer, the California legislature enacted a, a provision which provides for 30 days before the hearing date, because hearings might settle, that you then make an, an application for a pro hoc vice. And there's a provision to do that, and you pay a fee. Here, it was three months beforehand, well before that time would have arised when we had done that, when it was raised by the motion. Done it of, here in Massachusetts? Here in Massachusetts, where it was raised by the motion in the arbitration to disqualify the council or to stay the action. In our response, we moved pro hoc vice based on pro communications that where? are off. Pardon? Moved where? I'm sorry. To the arbitration panel based on our, com our office's conversations with the various bar associations who directed us to the clerk of this court who said to make it to the tribunal before which you are there. And we did that. The arbitration panel is, had is not Is there an affidavit ruled. to that effect? Yes, there is. It's the affidavit of Matthew Farley in the record. Okay. So you did all you could. Pardon? You did all you could. We did all we could. Not only that, but when it was brought before the single justice by counsel, for that, for a declaratory judgment action, the arbitrators did postpone the initial hearing date. 
They postponed it so that this way the decision of Justice Cordy could be rendered in sufficient time and then set another arbitration date. In the interim, we argued it before Justice Cordy. We came before the single justice. We provided him our rationale for the policies because there is not a specific provision in the law that, that provides for arbitration. The law that was enacted was enacted back in 1935, and it deals with judicial proceedings. At the time, arbitration was looked at suspiciously back then. In the decades that have followed, that rule has not kept up with the ever-changing practice of law and the strong public policy that is now in favor of arbitration. Well, arbitration we could, we could get rid of this case, or dispose of it would be a better word, by simply saying that you did all you could, really, and uh, having done that, you acted in good faith, and therefore it was for the arbitrators to decide whether you were properly there or the lawyer was properly there, and they did that. And, um, you know, they can commit very few errors that are legally cognizable, and that's the end of that. Yes, Your Honor. And forget about whether the statute applies, doesn't apply, um, should apply, might apply in the future if the rule's amended. In this case, yes, Your Honor, because there is a decision by Justice Cordy that stated at that time it was not, would not be the unauthorized practice of law in the facts of this particular case. Mr. Babnick, thank you for drawing my attention to Mr. Farley's affidavit. Was the substance, uh, this affidavit is dated April uh, 2005, which I take it is after um, the arbitration panel had concluded. Am I correct? Cor uh, uh, but was the substance of this, uh, no. first of all, the, the arbitration, I'm sorry. Was the, was the, the arbitration was in May. Was, was the substance May 2005? <clears throat> it was in May 17th of 2005. Okay. Was the substance of this, in particular, I'm, I'm looking at paragraph four, was the substance of this um, brought to the attention of the arbitration panel? Yes, and I'm, as I'm, as I was okay. answering your question, I was looking for the that's fine. section yeah. in the record. No, that's where fine. I, I'll find it. That so that, was, in other words, that you know. was brought to the arbitration attention in connection with our opposition and request to be admitted pro hoc vice before the arbitrators. We told the arbitrators. We contacted the clerk. The clerk said, "This is the procedure." We provided them the information where we had practiced beforehand, the only other time that we had been set foot in Massachusetts, which was a regulatory action that we were, had been admitted pro hoc vici by the administrative law judge, and we provided current certificates of good standing to the arbitration panel, just as you would before a court. And, and just remind me, um, because I, I had it, but I can't find it at the moment, uh, the date of Justice Cordy's um, um, single justice decision. The date of his decision, I believe it was May 6, 2005. It's so the last page in other words, before, the, before, the, um, before the, the arbitration. Correct, Your Honor. Okay. And touching upon the issue that was raised about the undue, obtaining an arbitration award by undue means, whether someone it was the unauthorized practice of law or was not the unauthorized practice of law, and we submit it was not the unauthorized practice of law, as Justice Cody did not abuse his discretion in looking at the policy behind the rules that I'll get to in just a moment. But as the other courts that have decided what means, what undue means, means under the Federal Arbitration Act, of which the Massachusetts Act is modeled after, means by procuring a, a, an award by fraud or corruption. Certainly in this case, there was no procuring of the award by fraud or corruption. Everyone knew, and the arbitrators it had been positioned to them, the Supreme, the single justice had informed the arbitrators that it would not be the uh, unauthorized practice of law. And, it, and this award was rendered with eyes wide open to all facts and circumstances, including the arbitrators, which included a trial court judge from the state of, former trial court judge from the state of New Hampshire, looking at this and knowing that these lawyers were New York lawyers, were not Massachusetts lawyers, making a decision that it didn't require us to be pro hoc vici in this matter, and having the decision of the single justice. Do you, do you know offhand, and if you don't, it's perfectly all right because I should know it, when, when the uh, advisory committee is supposed to report on Rule 5.5? I believe the next meeting is scheduled for the end of January. <laughs> I mean, it's the end of this month. The, 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 the comment period is closed, as I understand it, from our staff lawyer. 
I'll defer to the Chief Justice on that. I, th I think that's okay. the case. In other words, well, the, 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 the comment period is closed. I don't know what the comments are. But get back to my point is why, why should we get in a big fret over this if we can argue, argue, uh, arg arguably uh, affirm you on a narrow ground and uh, just leave this whole issue till later, not worry about beer bomb and everything else and trying to sort through all these cases about when you can do it and when you can't do it and all that stuff? I think that would be a wise course, Your Honor. I, I take it slightly differently, um, uh, Mr. Babnick, that if Justice Cordy had concluded that this was um, the authorized practice of law and the unauthorized practice of law, I, I assume that you would then have done something such as move Pro Hac Vice in front of him or, I mean, Yes, yes, Your Honor, we would have, but not only that, at the actual arbitration, we had <coughs> local counsel, who was our local counsel in this matter, Howard Smith, actually appear at the hearing, and in the interim between the single justice decision, there had been the emergency request for relief. At that juncture, we had Mr. Smith also appear, even though he wasn't familiar with the securities laws and the specialty area that was involved with, the, with with Reg T and margin for that, had him involved in the action actually appear at the hearing, even though we had the single justice's decision for that. Okay. And that's how we would have proceeded if, in fact, they had said that was the unauthorized practice of law. Well, that all goes to my point, that you did all you could. Yes, Your Honor. Is that and in the record, by the way, that, that he did appear at the arbitration proceeding? I don't know. I think it may be in your affidavit. <laughs> it, it may be in one of the affidavits, but I, I don't know. It is, is certainly one of the <coughs> certainly raised in the pleadings that are part of the docket in the federal court matter that the court can take judicial notice of. Can I ask this is a variant on, on what Justice Greeney has been asking you. Um, well, in this case, the technical issue of whether to confirm or vacate the award is not before us. It is before us in the case we just Hurt, the issue of whether unauthorized practice of law is a basis for vacating an award. If we decide in that case that it is not a basis for vacating an award, would that arguably make the everything in here now moot? The answer's got to be yes. The answer is yes. Yes. I mean, at that point, <coughs> in this case, but if that's our decision in the other case, Justice Toro can read that case as well. I'm sure you would bring it to his attention if it went your way. Um, then again, do we have to consider the only remaining issues would be ostensible disciplinary issues uh, or prosecution against people for unauthorized practice of law. Uh, but there wouldn't be any impact on this on the, on the outcome of this arbitration proceeding. I believe that's correct, Your Honor. And looking to an issue that was raised is the court's discipline of lawyers that come into the state of Massachusetts. Whether there's a rule that provides if someone comes physically present into the state, whether it's a private forum or into court, the court would have jurisdiction over that person for it. And certainly a non-Massachusetts resident, if something were to arise, if, if, if the lawyer wrecked havoc, they could certainly go to that home state's lawyer and complain there as well as their own state uh, to complain about that and certainly there would be disciplinary action taken as there should be uh, for it and that's not an issue, that shouldn't be a consideration for that because there is multiple layers of regulation that can be involved with this. If the court has no further questions we ask that you affirm the single justice's decision for that and thank you. Thank you Mr. Bethany. All right.